Hello, my name is Michael Henlein. I am Professor of Marketing at the Paris campus of ESCP. And I will be teaching you a class on research methods. This class is fully online. It consists of a series of 10 videos. And the purpose is to give you the theoretical foundation in order to write your master thesis. I'm explaining you the main concepts, the main approaches and the main steps to write a thesis. And later you will implement these steps and concepts in collaboration with your thesis supervisor by addressing the specific topic and research question you would like to focus on. In this first session, I want to talk about two things. First, I want to talk a little bit about the nature and process of research and as well as the structure of this class specifically related to research in business. And second, I want to talk a little bit about research strategies and the philosophical and theoretical foundations of doing research. So let's start with the first point. You may wonder why we are doing research in business at all. And the reason is actually very simple. We are doing research in business because we need new knowledge. There may be unresolved issues or a gap in the literature. For example, my work in marketing deals a lot with influencer marketing. There are concepts like TikTok or Twitch that we know very little about, and we want to understand this better. There may be a gap in literature. There may be a very important idea that nobody has looked at before. There may be societal developments that prompt a certain research questions. Look into the recent discussions around inequality or racism, for example. Or there may be inconsistencies among studies. Some studies may show one thing, other studies may show the other thing, and we need to understand how this can happen. Now, if you compare business research with research in fields like biology, physics, or chemistry, business research is often much more messy. The process is much less linear. You cannot go into a lab and run an experiment and then see exactly what happens. And therefore, you need to be very flexible. If your research involves questioning consumers or doing interviews with managers, you need to have a certain type of flexibility in everything you do. Now, flexibility does not mean you can be all over the place. So there's still an idealized process that you should follow. And I will outline this process in a minute. And it is this process that structures this entire class. Now, what you need to keep in mind is we do business research. We want to improve managerial decision making through something called evidence-based management by giving managers the pieces of information they need in order to take better decisions. If a manager does his work or her work exactly in the same way before reading your work and after reading your work, or to put it differently, if your work has no impact whatsoever on the decisions of a manager, a public policymaker, a consumer, a politician, then you need to ask your question, why did you even do the research? If you spend hours and hours in investigating a topic and it has no impact on anyone whatsoever, then probably you should have focused on a different topic to begin with. Now, I spoke about this ideal process of doing research in business. So how does this ideal process look like? You see it on this slide and it has essentially five steps. First, you need to identify the right research question. And this is really, really central because if you have the wrong question, you're running in the wrong direction and no matter what later you do, you cannot fix it again. Imagine you're in a forest and you want to find the way out. If you are running into the wrong direction, it doesn't matter how fast you run, it doesn't matter how long you run, it doesn't matter how good you are in running, if it's the wrong direction, you will never leave the forest. It's the same with the research question. And there are four big types. Some research work is simply about description. What is the phenomenon like and which forms does it assume? Some are about evaluation. Does a certain thing actually have the benefits that it is claimed to have? Sometimes it's about causes and consequences. Which variables impact the thing? And in turn, which other variables are the outcome measures of a thing? And at the end, it can also sometimes be about prediction. Does the thing happen under certain types of circumstances? Let's look at an example. 
more and more companies nowadays focus on ESG goals and on sustainability. Uh, descriptive work would be simply looking at the phenomenon. How do companies do this? Why do companies do this? How do they communicate about it? Evaluating the phenomenon. While most companies would focus on ESG because they think it makes the world a better place. Is this actually the case? How is the link between a company focusing on ESG and improving living conditions for people, for example? Explaining causes and consequences. If you look at a company adopting an ESG strategy, what is the result of this? For example, an improved shareholder value. And what are the antecedents of this? For example, a certain attitude towards sustainability among the top management. And finally, predicting an outcome. If you could measure ESG, can you say that one increase in ESG leads to half a percent increase in stock price, for example? Now, in order to come up with these questions, a very good starting point is always to simply look around you, talk to people, talk to managers, talk to whoever, probably your advisor, whoever you think can give you advice. And once you have identified the research question, the next step is to look at the literature because you need to understand what has already been done. At the beginning of your research, you might have the impression that your topic is really unique and that nobody has ever done anything like it. But in 99 out of 100 cases, this is not true. Somebody has looked probably not into exactly the same thing as you, but in something similar to what you are looking into. You need to understand what do we already know about the topic? Which concepts and theories have been applied to it? Which methods have been used to study it? Are there any controversies? Are there any contradictions in the topic? Is there a clash of evidence? Who are the key people and authors who wrote about it? Which type of articles did they write? Which type of books they write? You need to understand the lay of the land. It's coming back to the analogy of the forest. Before you decide in which direction you want to run, you need to get a map of the forest. You need to know how things look like. Then you need to develop a theory. And we talk much more about this in the second half of this session. You need to identify the concepts that make sense. And you need to give these concepts labels and put them into relationship to each other. And only when you have the question, the literature review and the theory, you can start going out and collecting data and ultimately writing the thesis. A very common problem in writing a thesis is that students want to start working as fast as possible, which means very fast they want to go out and collect data and analyzing data because collecting and analyzing data feels much more like work than simply reading stuff. But it is important to realize that this step of sampling and data collection and data analysis or ultimately writing your thesis can only come once you have theoretically understood what you want to focus on, what other people have already done, and what the best theory is to describe this phenomenon. Now, this course follows exactly this structure. In the next session, in session two, we talk about the research questions, how to formulate them, how to review literature, and how to decide on a research design. And then later, you will understand there are two main approaches, quantitative and qualitative research. And each of these two main approaches has three steps. Sampling, which is deciding who you want to collect data from, data collection, which is actually collecting the data, and data analysis, which is analyzing the data you have collected. In sessions three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, we will cover the spectrum. And the table on this slide shows you in detail the different points we focus on. And finally, in the last section, we talk about something called mixed methods research, which is research where you do at the same time qualitative and qualitative studies. We talk about ethics, and we talk about some key advice on how to write up your thesis. I know you would like to dive in as fast as possible into the precise ways of doing this and get very practical advice on how to actually write your master thesis. But let's take a couple of minutes to talk about the different philosophical perspective you can have on doing research, which is generally called research strategies. And the very first question you need to ask yourself is, how do you see the world? What are the two research strategies that exist? And there are two different kinds. One is called rationalism and one is called empiricism. 
Let's start with the first one, rationalism. Rationalism assumes that you can discover new things simply by thinking, by reason alone. You do not need to go out and observe things. You do not need to collect data. The reason for rationalism is because any form of data collection is unreliable. You ask people, they may lie. You analyze data, you might make a mistake. Probably you look at something, but because of optical illusions or dreaming, you don't even see what's actually going on. And if data collection is flawed and biased anyway, why would you even start collecting data to begin with? Now, the key example of rationalistic research is mathematics. Look at mathematics. If you derive a new mathematical theorem, if you want to prove something, which many of you have done at some point in your life, in the proof of Pythagoras theorem, for example, you do not go out and measure a million triangles and compare the areas. You simply think and make an analytical proof. And while rationalism is certainly a strategy that has its place in lots of fields, and even to some extent in business research, you could argue that business research largely focuses on the other side of the coin, which is empiricism. And this is what we are focusing on in the remainder of this section. Empiricism assumes that exactly the opposite. Knowledge can only be discovered by experience and by asking people, by talking to people or observing people, collecting data of some form. Why? Because business research has practical implications on decision makers. And in order to understand this, we need to look around us. Now, there are two different ways of collecting data. And we talk much more about this in the later section. One is qualitative and one is quantitative. Now, when we want to collect data, when we are in an empiricist view, we need to have different perspectives of how we think the world looks like. And this is reflected in the concepts of ontology, epistemology, and theory, and we talk about these now. Let's start with the first two, ontology and epistemology. What is this? What does this mean? The key question of ontology is, do you think the world exists around you independently of you looking at it or not? Is there a social reality outside that is there whether you look at it or not? And can you observe it objectively? Now, I guess this seems very, very abstract to you. So let's probably look a little bit into what this means precisely. In ontology, you have two different perspectives. One is called objectivism and one is called constructionism. Objectivism says that there are phenomena which have meaning and categories that exist independent of you. So you can go out and observe a social setting, a business setting, like you can observe a rat behaving in a lab or like you can observe a chemical reaction or a physics experiment. Constructionism is very different. Constructionism says that social phenomena and their meaning get made by the interactions between social actors. And it implies that they do not exist independently, that they are in a constant state of flow, and that by you observing people, you influence people. Let me give you a very simple example. Assume you want to find out how much value a person plays on luxury items. You have friends, you know that some people they place a lot of value of having branded clothes or designer handbags or shoes, and other people pay much, much less value to that. If you have an objectivist view, you think by asking the question, how important is it that you have a branded product on a scale from one unimportant to seven very important, you can get the true answer because this true answer is out there. If you have a constructionist perspective, you would think by me asking you, you already change your answer because you know that I will make a judgment about you based on the type of answers you give me. The difference between both is much more subtle, but this probably gives you a first step. Now, let's look at the second concept, which is called epistemology. And epistemology asks the question, what is acceptable knowledge? I told you that the thesis is all about discovering new knowledge, but what is knowledge even? And can you study the world around you scientifically? Is it appropriate to use methods that we know from natural sciences and apply them to business research? And then we look at epistemology, 
we have two concepts. One is called positivism and one is called interpretivism. Positivism assumes that you can study a business setting like you can study a physics experiment in a lab. There are experimental methods from hard sciences that we can use. Experiments is a classic example, and they can be applied to any form of setting, including business research. Very often, positivism would use quantitative data in order to measure observed behavior. And the idea of positive research is very often to come up with mathematical statements and facts to discover something resembling a law of nature. Look at economics, for example. If we increase the minimum wage in a country by 10%, then unemployment will change by X percent. This is a very classical positivist view because we assume there is a law that links together minimum wage and unemployment. And the researcher is detached, objective, and simply tries to observe whatever is going out there. Now, the exact opposite of this is interpretivism. Interpretivism assumes that people and their interactions can only be understood by interpretation. And if two people observe the same setting, they may come up with two different conclusions because they interpret the settings differently. Since business research does not deal with laws of nature, it is not a science and it cannot come up with these type of laws of nature. In hard science, we study things that have no consciousness, like a ball falling to the earth due to gravity, while in business and in sociology, the individuals we study have consciousness, so they need to be interpreted. They may be influenced by us being there. And only when we try to understand the viewpoint from the other side, we can actually truly understand what's going on. These two perspectives, whether you are objectivist or constructivist and positivist or interpretivist, will influence a lot of the type of decisions that you make later, and we talk about this in a minute. However, what is independent of this is the importance of theory. So what is theory? What is a good theory? Well, a good theory aims to describe a setting in a way that we understand the phenomenon and understand why it's happening. A good theory aims to give decision support to a manager, for example. A theory is, for example, why do some customers get satisfied when they product and others do not get satisfied? We try to identify the setting, we try to observe the phenomenon, and we try to provide an explanation. It includes independent variables, dependent variables, and intervening variables, like a lot of bubbles that you link together with arrows, and these arrows are called hypotheses. We need theory because theory provides a generalized context to data. If you collect data from 30 individuals by doing an interview, or by 1,000 individuals by running a questionnaire, or if you observe 50 companies and see what they do, Whatever findings you get only apply theoretically to those 30, 1,000 or 50 units. It is only through theory that we can generalize things. There are different types of theories. Some are called macro theory, which deal with very large level relationships like international relations, for example. And the exact opposite are micro theories, which deal with the relationships between individuals. For example, in sociology, a very common topic is to look at dating behavior and how the emergence of online dating apps changes the way how people form relationships, classical micro theory. Theories consist of three parts, concepts, constructs, propositions, and the theory itself. So let's look at each of these in detail. Concepts and contracts are the building blocks of theory. Imagine little bubbles. Satisfaction is a construct. Unemployment is a construct. Happiness is a construct. Motivation is a construct. It is an idea about an object. Hypothesis and propositions link constructs together. You have construct A and B, and you say A impacts B or B impacts A. Very often propositions and hypotheses are illustrated by arrows. There are statements about the relationship between two concepts and some form of logical linking. Smoking is bad for your health. 
And a theory is a coherent set of such bubbles and arrows. If you simply throw 10 bubbles on the slide and make 50 arrows to it, you don't get a theory. In the same way as if you open your kitchen cupboard and throw everything into a pot and cook it, you do not necessarily get a meal. For a theory, things need to be consistent and coherent. And the point of a theory is always to explain what's going on. And there are many theories and you will come across some of them in this class and in your research. You can also Google them if you want. You can pause the video, go to Wikipedia and check things like the theory of recent action, social exchange theory. There are literally hundreds of theories that can be. Now, an interesting question is how do you come up with the theory? And there are two different ways of coming up with theory. And they are called deductive and inductive research. In inductive research, you develop theory from data. You start with observations, then you try to group the observations into concepts. You try to understand the relationships between these concepts through propositions, and you come up with a theory. Inductive reasoning starts with observations to identify a general pattern. Deductive reasoning is exactly the opposite. It starts with a theory based on this forms propositions and expectations, and then tries to test those expectations using data. Now, how does this all fit together? How do these concepts of, now let me go back, objectivism, constructivism, positivism, and interpretivism, deductive and inductive thinking, how do they fit together and how do they map into something that you probably are more familiar with, which is qualitative versus quantitative research? In quantitative research, very often you have a view that is objectivist, positivist, and deductive. Quantitative research, in most cases, aims to quantify the collection analysis of data. It takes the view that social reality is external and can be observed, and that the methods from the natural sciences can be applied to study consumers, managers, companies. Very often it has a deductive approach where we start with the theory, form expectations, and then test them. We try to measure variables. We have research designs like surveys or experiments. We have numerical data, objectivist, positivist, and deductive. Different to this is qualitative research. Qualitative research very often uses interviews, ethnography. And if you don't know yet what this means, don't worry, we talk about this in the later sections. Instead of based on numbers, it's based on texts and stories. It emphasizes words rather than quantified numbers. It takes a view of social reality as constantly changing, and it assumes that the ways we study objects <coughs> in physics cannot be applied to business research. Constructivist, interpretivist, and inductive. What is important here is the following. For many students at the beginning of their research process, it appears that the choice between quantitative and qualitative is random. <clears throat> you could do one or the other. Sometimes people choose qualitative over quantitative because they think they are not good in statistics and hence doing qualitative is easier to do. Sometimes people want to minimize work and they think doing 30 interviews is easier than collecting 100 questionnaires. All of this is wrong. Qualitative is not easier than quantitative. Qualitative is not more subject to interpretation than quantitative. Qualitative is not less rigorous than quantitative. Whether you choose qualitative or quantitative research depends on your view of the world, on the specific type of research question that you want to target and how you think knowledge can best be created. If this is something that interests you, I encourage you to go online. There is a link here where you can find an article that introduces you into more detail to these topics. This is the end of session one. We'll see you in a minute for session two.